they want Biden, at least for now, because he's a puppet. Um, so, so, okay, why not just have a primary season and let the best person win? Well, the answer is no, the Democrats don't actually believe in democracy. They like to rig the game. They kicked, uh, they, they tried to get New Hampshire to move its primary after South Carolina. You know, New Hampshire is always the first primary in the country. Um, but <laughs> New Hampshire is completely run by Republicans. We have a governor, Sununu, and both houses of legislature are controlled by Republicans and stay. I, I live in New Hampshire, but I'm coming to you live from New Hampshire right now. Um, and um, uh, by statute, New Hampshire has to be first. It's not even a choice or a committee decision. It's actually the law of the state of New Hampshire. Today, we have a fascinating topic at hand. The influence of third parties on U.S. presidential elections, as elucidated by renowned economist and political analyst Jim Rickards. As Rickards aptly puts it, a week is a lifetime in politics, highlighting the ever-evolving landscape of electoral dynamics. In this video, we'll dissect Rickard's insights, exploring historical precedents and contemporary implications of third-party involvement in shaping the course of American democracy. To begin, let's underscore the significance of third parties in the electoral arena. While they may often seem marginal, relegated to the sidelines of mainstream politics, their impact can be profound especially in closely contested races. Rickards draws parallels to past elections, notably citing the pivotal role of third-party candidates such as Ross Perot in 1992 and Teddy Roosevelt in 1912. These instances serve as poignant reminders of how a seemingly minor disruption can alter the course of history. Rickards offers a retrospective analysis of the 2016 election, where Donald Trump's unexpected victory defied conventional wisdom. Despite Hillary Clinton's lead in the popular vote, Trump's strategic triumph in key battleground states underscored the delicate balance of electoral dynamics. Importantly, Rickards highlights the impact of third-party candidates, such as Jill Stein, whose modest share of the vote potentially tipped the scales in crucial states, reshaping the electoral landscape. Uh, you know, a week is a lifetime in politics. That's a cliche, but it's a true cliche. Um, things change rapidly, and it's very hard to make forecasts and predictions. So why would you do it so far in advance? And and the answer was that, uh, yeah, that's all true. But things are happening right now that uh, where you can see the implications of it. They will affect the election in November, um, and we don't want our viewers and our readers to be su surprised. We want, um, you know, kind of how people structure their portfolios is up to them, but we at least want them to know uh, what's coming and what's happening and um, not be taken by surprise. So, and you can say that and you can write about it, but people have trouble internalizing it because they have a certain way of thinking about the election. You need to kind of break that up a little bit and, and think, um, uh, you know, in a little, little bit more open-ended way. Now let's talk specifically about third parties and then I'll come back to, to Trump and Biden. Um, this will be the most significant third party year since 1992. Now, there are always third parties, but they usually get 1% of the vote, 2% of the vote. You know, the Libertarians always run somebody. Uh, the Green Party always runs somebody. They're on the ballot and they have a nominee every year. Although don't underestimate the impact of a one or two percenter. Um, and now I'll go back to 2016 when Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, everyone knows the story on, on even on the morning of the election, Hillary Clinton was getting like 92 percent odds of winning, 94 percent odds of winning. Nobody thought could Trump win. Trump didn't think Trump was going to win. Melania didn't think Trump was going to win. There were only a handful of people, um, you know, myself, uh, Steve Bannon and a, and a few others who, um, uh, you know, kind of raised their hands and said, yeah, Trump is going to win. But that was a really tiny, tiny group. Um, but. But why did he win? Well, he, he took some key states, you know, Michigan, um, Wisconsin, uh, Pens Pennsylvania, the so-called blue wall turned into a red wall, at least for Trump. But in those states, he, remember Hillary got more popular votes. A place like California, she'll get 6 million more votes than Trump. It doesn't matter because you can only win California once. Yeah, Hillary got all the electoral votes in California. It doesn't matter if she won by six votes or 6 million votes. You only get those electoral votes one time. 
but she did win by like six million votes. So, so Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. So, you, but but that's not how presidential politics works. It work you go state by state, electoral vote by electoral vote, and in places like Wisconsin, Trump won, but only about like less than one percent or close to one percent. Well, Jill Stein, who is the Green Party candidate. Got about two percent, and to this day, you know, Hillary blames everyone for the loss: the Russians and uh, you know, trolls and robots and uh, everything else. But um, but in, in Wisconsin, Jill Stein might have cost her that state and um, and, and cost her the election. So even the one or two percent in, in a world where the two leading candidates are only one percent apart. A third party that takes one or two percent can affect the outcome. So I wouldn't underestimate that. But having said that, this is going to be much, much bigger. This is going to look like 1992, where Ross Perot got 19 percent. Now Ross Perot did not win one single state, but he took an enormous amount of votes from George H. W. Bush, and we got Bill Clinton uh, as a result.、Uh, Bill Clinton was elected twice, never got a majority of the, of the popular vote. He won in 1992 with something like. 43 percent of the vote、It、wasn't even close to 50 percent, but it was more than George Bush,、uh, George H. W. Bush.、Uh, and if if Perot had not run, and he disaggregated his vote, you know, some would have voted for Clinton, but more would have voted for George H. W. Bush. George H. W. Bush would have won that election, except for Ross Perot.、Um, when else has that been such a big factor in U.S. history? Well, the other time was 1912.、Uh, what happened then? Well. You know, Teddy Roosevelt became president after William McKinley was assassinated. Early, McKinley won the presidential election in 1900. He was assassinated soon after. Teddy Roosevelt was the vice president who became the, the president. In fact, uh, uh, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt was hiking and camping in the Adirondacks. It took him two days to find him. He was up near、uh, Mount Marcy,、uh, if you know the、uh, Adirondacks.、It、took a couple days to find him. They said, "Hey, you're the president." So he served out. The remainder of McKinley's term, and then a full term on his own. Now, at the time, there was no、um, no prohibition on running three or four times. In fact, FDR did win win the election four times.、Um, so Roosevelt could have run again in 1908, but chose not to,、um, and turned it over to William Howard Taft, who was his vice president in his first and only full term, and Taft won. So now we get to 1912, and the Republicans are like, "Well, this is easy. We'll renominate Taft. He's a sitting incumbent president. We'll nominate him." The Democrats nominated Woodrow Wilson, but Teddy Roosevelt changed his mind, decided he wanted to run. He contested the Republican nomination with Taft. Taft won, but then Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, goes out and starts a third party called the Bull Moose Party. And he got also about 19 percent of the vote, about the same as Ross Perot. Didn't win, did not win a single state, but it cost Taft the election. And we got Woodrow Wilson. And what did Woodrow Wilson give us?、Um, the、um, the Federal Reserve, <laughs> the income tax,、um, direct election of senators. All these progressive ideas,、um, really bad ideas in many ways, came、uh, World War One、uh, came. Uh, under Woodrow Wilson, but Wilson would not have won if Teddy Roosevelt hadn't been a third party. So 1912, 1992 are your two models. 1968 a little bit with George、uh, George Wallace, although not as big a factor as the others. That's the kind of year this is going to be. So right now,、uh, RFK Jr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. tried really hard to be a Democrat. I mean, who's who's more Democratic than the Kennedy family, right? Going back to you know the 19 Joseph P. Kennedy in the 1940s,、um, no one.、Uh, but the the Democratic Party today is not the Democratic Party of JFK and、um, and, and RFK Jr.'s father, you know, Bobby Kennedy.、Uh, it's completely changed. It's it's radical. It's extreme. It's so-called progressive, but really neo-Marxist. Um, and they really don't have any interest in RFK Jr. They want Biden, at least for now, because he's a puppet.、Um, so, so okay, why not just have a primary season and let the best person win? Well, the answer is no. The Democrats don't actually believe in democracy. They like to rig the game. They kicked.、Uh, they they tried to get New Hampshire to move its primary after South Carolina. You know, New Hampshire is always the first primary in the country. Um, but New Hampshire is completely run by Republicans. We have a governor, Sununu, and both houses of legislature are controlled by 
Republicans and stay. I, I live in New Hampshire, but I'm coming to you live from New Hampshire right now. Um, and um, uh, by statute, New Hampshire has to be first. It's not even a choice or a committee decision. It's actually the law of the state of New Hampshire. Drawing parallels to historical precedents, Rickards paints a compelling narrative of how third party movements have historically challenged the status quo. From Ross Perot's formidable showing in 1992 to Teddy Roosevelt's bull moose insurgency in 1912, these episodes serve as cautionary tales of the potency of alternative voices in shaping political outcomes. By invoking these historical analogies, Rickards illuminates the potential reverberations of current third party endeavors in the upcoming election cycle. Rickards delves into the contemporary political landscape, highlighting the emergence of new contenders poised to disrupt the two-party duopoly. With figures like RFK Jr. and Cornel West entering the fray, the traditional contours of partisan politics are being challenged. RFK Jr.'s departure from the Democratic fold underscores broader ideological schisms within the party while West's candidacy under the Green Party banner injects fresh energy into the political discourse. New Hampshire announced the date of the New Hampshire primary, and guess what? It's a week before South Carolina. The DNC, Democratic National Committee, wanted South Carolina to go first because uh, what happened in, in uh, 2020. Uh, Joe Biden finished fifth in New Hampshire, fifth, not second or third, fifth behind uh, of Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar, um, and I think Buttigieg and a couple, a couple of the other candidates at the time. Um, but he won South Carolina. So they want South Carolina to be first. It's not happening. Now, Biden said, well, okay, I'm not running in New Hampshire. All right. Um, Kennedy was going to run, but then they said, DNC said, anybody who runs in New Hampshire, if you get any delegates, um, we're not going to seat those delegates at the convention. So it won't do you any good. Uh, and then they went further. They said, it's not just Ronnie, if you set foot in New Hampshire, if you even go to New Hampshire. Um, and, you know, the thing about New Hampshire politics is the ultimate retail politics. I mean, I, I met many of the candidates in uh, 2020, and I've already, I, I was at a, I had a talk with Vivek Ramaswamy. He was at a local uh, town hall here. It was, it was a small group, and he was very open. So talked to him for a little bit, and the other candidates will be coming through in the weeks ahead. It's only two months away. Um, so so kennedy was basically forced out of the party by the democrats themselves and he's going third party he's polling around 15 percent, and that's without much effort he's getting a ton of money a lot of contributions he's got the money he's got the brains he's got the lawyers he's in the process of getting on the ballot that's hard i worked for uh uh, uh, I was involved in, uh, was it 2012 with a third party effort and a presidential candidate and had some top notch polling. So I actually have a little experience uh, in how that all works behind the curtain. Not easy to get on the ballot, but Kennedy can do it. Now you've got Cornell West is running uh, on the Green Party ticket uh, for the nomination. Moreover, Rickard sheds light on the evolving dynamics within the Democratic Party exemplified by the marginalization of figures like RFK GR. This internal fissure reflects broader ideological realignments, with traditional democratic values giving way to more radical, progressive agendas. Rickard's astute observation of these shifting tides underscores the fluidity of contemporary politics, where alliances are forged and loyalties tested in the crucible of electoral competition. One cannot overlook the potential impact of figures like Joe Manchin, whose foray into presidential politics heralds a new chapter in the annals of third-party activism. Manchin's brand of pragmatic centrism, embodied by his listening tour, presents a stark contrast to the ideological fervor gripping mainstream politics. As Rickards suggests, Manchin's potential candidacy under the No Labels Party emblemates a broader yearning for political moderation in an era of partisan polarization. Cornell West is a uh, kind of a hard shell Marxist. I don't agree with much, of, if anything, of what he says, but he is brilliant. A great TV presence, a great, great rhetorically, uh, great, on, as I say, great on TV, great public speaker. Um, so whether you agree with him or not, yeah, that is what it is. But I'm trying to evaluate him as a candidate. Uh, he's very powerful. He's smart, uh, articulate, telegenic. He'll get out there and he'll get votes. 
And Jill Stein is back. She's running on the Green Party too. I'm not sure how Cornell West and Jill Stein are going to sort that out. But the other, you know, kind of, you know, 200 pound gorilla in the room is Joe Manchin. Uh, Joe Manchin is United States Senator from West Virginia, a Democrat. Uh, he was probably going to lose. He's up for election this year. So just the other day, he announced he's not running for Senate. So you can kind of flip that seat over to the Republicans. It, it's uh, even Republicans aren't dumb enough to lose West Virginia. So um, so he'll probably get so that'll be a Republican seat, which is a big deal in terms of the Senate. But Manchin said he didn't announce he was running for president, but he said I'm going on what they call a, a listening tour, meaning you go around the country, you go to whatever, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Rotary Club, uh, you, you know, a high school auditorium, uh, you know, a, 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 a dinner, et cetera. Um, and the, and you, you kind of get your name out there and get all the local press coverage uh, and you get to hear what people think. Well, that is a prelude to announcing that he's going to run for president. So he hasn't formally announced yet, but uh, I expect he will. And he'll probably go on something called the No Labels Party. Uh, I guess No Label is a label, but uh, they, they've done it. They did it with this other party I was talking about in 2012 I worked with. Did They got on the ballot. 